I am so, so proud to be able to bring you our next guest, uh, Vivian Kubrick, to you all. She is so well known for her own work as an American filmmaker and composer, and she's also known for her work with her father, filmmaker Stanley Kubrick. And so I'm now uh, bringing uh, Vivian in to speak with us. So thank you, Vivian, for joining us. There we go. I can't see you. It and seems I can't to have actually um, disconnected Vivian when I. Shall I try and reconnect? Odd technical uh, interruption. Oh, there you are. Thank you. I'm so glad the connection was good. You literally <laughs> disappeared. Did. You weren't even on the uh, the panelist or attendees list for a few seconds. It was just no, gone. I, no, I, I have to say I'm completely winging it. I actually can't even hear myself. So I, I'm going to have to take an air. Anyway, I'm not sure how this bloody thing works, but as long as you can hear me and I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Uh, can You can hear me all right too? Yeah, perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for being here. Oh, my God. I I have to say that I, I, I'm almost speechless, you know, just sort of trying to think of the million things that I'd like to say about Julian, but I think the primary cause here is that as humanity if we don't raise our consciousness to the point that we all appreciate the essential nature of truth and that whatever balance of power exists on this planet that if we don't learn how to uh, you know exchange oh something just appeared on my screen sorry <laughs> no that's um, just uh, our tech help okay. telling us that you it's all right. Not a problem at all. Zoom just okay. shows us the chat that way. Right. So, uh, sorry, let me get back in the swing. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know where to look. Uh, it's totally fine. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think that, you know, if we don't learn how to balance power on this planet between the, the population of humanity and the so-called leaders, which, of course, you know, there seems to be a horrible inverse law that those least equipped to be leaders tend to be the ones that manage to get up there. And of course, I'm sure that's by design. Uh, but I think that what Julian is doing is he's trying to bring on a, well, I don't know that he's definitely trying to do this, but it seems to me that this will be the effect. He's trying to bring mankind forward and raise consciousness to the point where if we're to evolve, into higher beings, if we're to go beyond our own planet and into the stars and be worthy of meeting other intelligent life, we're going to have to get our act together. You know, this whole idea of secrecy, for one thing, as being, you know, the primary statecraft tool is a disaster. It, it's, it's totally is stultifying human progress because, of course, you know, social engineering uh, I mean, how can that be anything other than just a horrible manipulation? And first of all, it's, it's, I mean, of course, this is way beyond the consciousness of the people that do it, but it's so bloody disrespectful. I mean, it's a sort of a, you know, you <laughs> for, you know, just giving me, uh, you know, total nonsense for which I'm unable to think with it or act in a meaningful way. And of course, I mean, it's quite obvious that that's intended because they want you to do what they want you to do. Um, in fact, actually, there's a very good documentary that uh, was made in Germany on the First World War. Of course, I can't remember the name now, but it's, I think it was on Netflix. It was like 17 you know, shows. But it covers the whole subject of the way in which um, propaganda was used, to, first of all, to manipulate men, to essentially, literally be cannon fodder, and to, you know, take what is essentially a, a heroic and decent nature in people and make them fling themselves against a meaningless and impossible to be victorious war, for instance. Um, and I think it was, uh, was it George Orwell that said that, you know, those that actually, you know, bring on war, it was Aldous Huxley, isn't one of the two, um, you know, they're not going to be fighting it. And when you look at all of the ways in which, for instance, 
talking of Julian, that he's tried to expose what doubtless were um, horrific losses of control and leadership in the field of battle, where, you know, like My Lai in Vietnam in 68, or, you know, uh, you know, the Sand Creek massacre in the, of the, you know, Indians in America in the mid 19th century, you know, whatever these collapses of leadership that have occurred, um, you know, these are just horrible expressions of what happens when mankind sinks to the lowest form of communication that they can possibly be, right? You've stopped talking, you've stopped negotiating, you're just lobbing grenades at each other. And of course, the ultimate expression of this horrific mentality was the atom bomb, which, you know, continues to be something that most of us are just sort of whistling by the graveyard, just sort of going, ah, I can't think about that. Um, Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, in a slight kind of adrenaline rush, I'm just not shutting up. But no, absolutely. <laughs> Our audience is, is uh, no doubt like just uh, totally happy to hear what you have to say about uh, the importance of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And I think that what you're discussing about the, the violence that humanity is capable of is goes to exactly what WikiLeaks is one of the last safeguards against is that kind of total mutual annihilation of, uh, through warfare. Um, what, what was it um, so to give our audience some background on how you got it, uh, have become attra attracted to WikiLeaks and to the point that you would want to speak out for Julian Assange, how that developed for you personally as a filmmaker? Um, well, it, it really not as a filmmaker, just as a human being. Um, I, I really, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole of all of this in about when I was about, I don't know, 45, which is quite late in the game. Um, but it was really when I started to investigate the ways in which our health freedoms were being interfered with. And I studied homeopathy back in the late 80s. And even then, of course, I was cognizant of all the ways in which homeopathy has been outlawed uh, and you know don't get me started on the pharmaceutical industry uh, but um, I think really actually all of these subjects suffer from exactly the same problem which is that individuals have you I always talk about this the, um, and I never bloody remember the director's name, but the film There Will Be Blood. Have you ever seen that? Yes, I've seen right. that. Right. So I always think of that film as a wonderful uh, demonstration of the what I regard as the kind of individual who's capable of such total, I mean, you know, Hitler being another one, total exclusion of reality and empathy for the rest of living things. And I think that the, as I said in the beginning, you know, those least qualified to be in a leadership position or to be at the head of huge, um, you know, industries, which frankly, I think they are helped there. I mean, I think of Amazon and Jeff Bezos and his connection with the CIA or, you know, Zuckerberg who, is increasingly looking more zombie-like every time I see him interviewed. I mean, I, I want to believe that, in, that he's just a terrified man that just doesn't know how to step out of the horrible uh, machine he stepped into. But Facebook and the things that, uh, well, as I say, when I started, there are a million things uh, and I'm trying to sort of like focus here, but going back to Julian and why I became so interested in him is that I remember and I, I think it was uh, Chelsea Manning's, um, you know, sort of blast of documents, whatever. And I got, I joined up to WikiLeaks and I got a communication saying, please download all of these documents because we're trying to protect this. And I remember sort of struggling with Tor and trying to sort of like figure out, you know, how to use, I never did. Um, and I did, I downloaded all of these documentation uh, documents. And I think that, um, the sort of poetic beauty of the internet being originally a military effort to protect um, the first strike, you know, nuclear exchange, not losing communication, not having the head chopped off, you know, um, that it should end up being the way in which humanity 
liberates itself from such activity. Because look, there's no question, and I'm sure this won't be appreciated by everyone, but I do really, really support the Second Amendment. I think that, you know, you look at every group that has ever been um, eliminated, you know, exterminated even, the first thing that happened is they had no longer any guns. They had no way to defend themselves. And if you look at all of the footage of which I've watched, you know, hundreds of hours on the Second World War and the Holocaust, you know, those people just had no way to defend themselves. Now, the most important part, which is, again, the way in which the internet is liberating people and, and why I feel that it's so important to me to, you know, to whatever meaningful way I encourage people to step up and just go, you know what? I don't care if they dox me. I don't care if they say the most horrible things about me. I'm going to, I'm going to have the uh, self-integrity to let all of this stuff just pass through me and continue to stand there and speak, not with aggression, not with insult, because that's something that I think is so insidious is the abuse that people hurl at each other, no matter how heartfelt it is. Because, I, again, you know, I'm going off on tangents here, but I think it's relevant. Um, the way in which reality TV has, um, uh, you know, in every way propagated this idea that you go, what the fuck? Who the hell do it? You know, and it's like, oh my God, if this is what people think is communication, I'm like, I'm gonna fucking kill her. You know, all this, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I've watched a lot of them in fascination or like, you know, that bitch, she doesn't know what, near. and it's like, this is done for a reason. They want people to no longer be able to actually have a debate, have an exchange of ideas where I say, I like chocolate and you say, I like vanilla. And we go, cool. You know, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, where you can say, I like vanilla because it's so delicate. And he says, I like chocolate because it's so yummy, whatever it is that that is that is permitted and i know i'm choosing an, an absurd analogy there but i'm just trying to sort of take all of the you know emotion out of it uh and in fact the more important these issues are the more essential it is to maintain a cool polite and um interested in what the other person is saying not just waiting for the person to shut up so you can say the next thing um and I've noticed that over the decades, you know, I was born in 1960, so I remember the sort of very early British TV where it was all over, and sir, what do you feel about this? And I said, no, 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 let them speak. You know, it was much more sort of like <laughs> civilized. And, um, you know, now it's just, uh, it's not possible, I think, for people to see a role model of how to actually speak to one another in a way where you intend to exchange an idea to maybe, God forbid, actually change your mind about something because of something that somebody else said. Uh, and I also think that the tone of TV and the fact that, you know, I sound like an old bugger saying this, you know, because uh, I remember people saying this when I was young. But, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. The TV and films are absolute, unadulterated, revolting, horrific violence where people, you know, who are criminals and, you know, the lowest of the low, admittedly, it's, it's entertaining. I don't deny that for a second. But, you know, whatever happened to the exchange of, of, of meaningful, spiritually important stories? You know, what happened to that? I mean, the film, is, the film industry has turned into sort of like, you know, six flags on on the screen. You know, it's just a big roller coaster. And in fact, most of the interesting things that manage to get through are on TV. You know, um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. My admiration for Julian is specifically that he has maintained his integrity and despite the most uh, inhumane, cruel treatment that he's received yes he hasn't been electrocuted and beaten and thrown in the bottom of a you know dungeon i mean we have advanced uh, to that degree 
in some areas, right? Certainly Guantanamo Bay is probably a different scene. But, you know, you can torture people by destroying their lives. You can, you know, and his life is very meaningfully destroyed. And I actually on Twitter, um, somebody sent me a thing saying, well, Julian can just walk out anytime he wants. You know, what's the big deal? And I said, you know something, for you to say that would mean that you know more than he and his legal team know, which I doubt, you know. So you can assume that if he's not leaving that building, he has very, very significant reasons not to do so. And for anyone to say that he's just being a woods or something for not leaving the building is just, uh, first of all, ignorant of every, you know, evidence of how that is not the case. I mean, Edward Snowden is clearly not an idiot. And even he realized that there was no way he could release those documents in a way that he would not be destroyed unless he did it the way he did it. You know, to have gone through the normal channels would mean that he'd simply meet with the same entities that were performing this destructive surveillance in the first place. I mean, it's just stupid. It's like saying to your jailer, um, please uh, don't be mean to me. Can you let me out? You know, uh, no, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, I feel that the more that people realize that the threat that faces them is coming from an extremely small number of people who frankly, and again, I'm going to draw on my knowledge of the film industry, which is, believe me, just as shark infested as the, you know, powers that be, um, because it's tremendous amount of money. It's part of the whole uh, social engineering program. It's uh, huge egos. And I'm sure that really it's quite a wonderful microcosm of, you know, the geopolitical players on the chessboard of the world. And I would say that from my experience with my father, of course, this is why I thought that it might be interesting for people is that I do have a kind of a different um, reality than most people because I have effectively been on the fly, uh, you know, a fly on the wall of a very uh, famous man who was rather well known for his um, capacity to get the things that he needed despite all the ways in which he was disempowered. I mean, how about this? He doesn't own a single film that he made. You know, you have no power as a filmmaker, you know, because the, the money is so massive, there's no way you could fund something yourself. So in fact, the films are owned by the studios. And um, his way of handling it was that he incinerated every outtake, all negatives, all prints that weren't the final master negative in order to, you know, quite sensibly prevent any future changes of his films. I mean, of course, you know, you can always have edits and cuts or whatever, but, you know, if you've destroyed everything, you know, there's nothing that they can do. Um, however, he died before he managed to uh, incinerate all of the outtakes of Eyes Wide Shut, and I have made it a personal effort of mine to try and get that done, but it still hasn't been done after all these years. Anyway. No, that's incredibly um, fascinating and illuminating for all of our viewers to hear that. How, um, how that, that lack of control over, over uh, uh, the filmmaker's, uh, you know, uh, artwork almost, what do you, how do you feel like that translates to WikiLeaks and, and your motivation for supporting them in their efforts? Because obviously art is one of the most, potentially anyway, um, elevating and inspiring and a, a sort of a, a, a complex synthesizing of the human condition. I hate to sound pretentious. <laughs> um, and so, you know, artists are, and, you know, I fully expect myself to be kicked in the head after doing this, uh, but um, uh, artists are quite brutally um, and in a very 21st century way removed from dialogue with the rest of humanity simply by not being given work. 
you know, I mean, actually, just on something slightly different, um, uh, Harvey Weinstein destroyed many actresses' careers simply, and, you know, this is par for the course. When you make a film, my father would do the same thing. He would call people that had worked with the actors or actresses in question that he wanted to use, and he'd say, how was it, you know? Uh, of course, the strain of it often causes many of them to be drug addicts. So you want to find that out. You want to find out if they have a drug problem. And if they do, you're not going to use them. And, um, you know, Harvey destroyed many of these women's careers simply because they insulted his manhood by refusing him sex. And again, you know, I have plenty of experience of my own of how this works. I mean, you know, I won't go into it right now, but the film industry is, as I am sure it is in politics, uh, a, a really um, debauched in many areas, particularly the higher you go, um, and depraved um, situation to find yourself in where people, I mean, we all know this about the Secret Service. We all know they have hotel rooms in London, in New York, or whatever. They, and you know, this whole stuff about pedophilia and you know, prostitutes or homosexuals, you know, when it, homosexuality was completely a no-no, where they would drug someone, stuff them in a room, you know, set them up, take photographs of them and then blackmail them. You know, I think that this is why Licky Weeks, uh, <laughs> Licky Weeks, um, WikiLeaks is, uh, <laughs> um, is so incredibly important and why Julian has God that that man has allowed himself to be the center of the target, you know, because he's not the only person. There's other people in WikiLeaks and there's all the people that help put it together and the people that send in, you know, documentation. But th that he's allowed himself to be the center of that target is, is you know, I'm really not overdoing it by saying it's Christ-like. It is a Christ consciousness type thing of where you understand that there is no other way forward other than to allow yourself to be crucified. Now, obviously, modern crucif crucifixion, you know, just like, you know, in the old days, people used to go to hangings to get their thrills or go to the stocks and throw cabbages and tomatoes at people. You know, the newspapers have really, which is hilarious when you think about their real purpose, the newspapers are performing that function. They're allowing people to be humiliated and, um, their reputation so destroyed that no one sees them anymore as an important voice. So at least Julian hasn't been subjected to that, although they tried that with that ridiculous sex, you know, um, indictment or whatever from whatever. Uh, <laughs> investigation allegation uh, never charges, thankfully. Um, um, yeah. And that's a that's a smear that's used against him very often by the media. But it's interesting that you uh, bring up the 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 pedophilia and the debauchery in all of these different areas of government and also in Hollywood. Um, I, we know that actually um, uh, that the, the, a smear was designed against Julian Assange that was going to uh, uh, accuse him of pedophilia, and they actually had a CNN host um, accuse him of that, and then he had to retract. So there is no bottom to the pit of the the accusations that that the establishment is willing to throw at Julian Assange. It seems like. And uh, at Disobedient Media, we've definitely tried to cover and using WikiLeaks material, covering uh, the issues of human trafficking, uh, pedophilia in, in, within the establishment, the connection to intelligence services, and et cetera. And it, without WikiLeaks, that would have been impossible to report on. And that's absolutely incredibly important. So thank you for bringing that subject up. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry in connection with their work, because I, I think that's one of the subjects that people don't give WikiLeaks credit for exposing. And in Julian Assange's uh, personal history, he actually, uh, before WikiLeaks was founded, he he uh, gave the police information on a, uh, I believe it was a child porn uh, ring, um, an internet child porn, an early internet child porn ring. And so he turned them into the police. And so it's stories like that about Julian Assange and, and the work that WikiLeaks does that doesn't get the media attention and the public acknowledgement for, for his bravery and what they've done. But, um, you know, they, basically, though, their work covers so many different areas. And I, I was wondering, um, any any other areas like that that you think WikiLeaks has had really profound impact but hasn't been acknowledged uh, for the work that they've done? Well, actually, you'll forgive me, but I want to pick you up on a point. Um, the fact that you say that 
his work hasn't been acknowledged, that people are uh, lack discernment, to say the least, when they hear news reports, especially from, you know, uh, something that's so clearly simply the mouthpiece of the elite, the CNN is just laughable at this point. But what I wanted to talk to you about is what can we do to educate people? Because their inability to differentiate what is, what is um, essentially the equivalent of throwing a tomato at somebody, you know, versus actual truthful news. And I think that we can start, uh, and I wish that people would understand this. I mean, it's horrific how many people don't. They're just so completely uninformed. They absolutely are just like, you know, lambs to the slaughter when it comes to being given disinformation. But I think that at a very grassroots level, people are going to have to form their own, um, uh, you know, education system. Because, you know, schools teach, but they don't educate. They don't educate you to be a critical thinker or indeed a, a, a responsible member of the human race. You are taught to just be one little cog in the great machine. If that, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, you've seen it in like, you know, pre-revolutionary uh, pre France where, you know, the peasants, it was against the law to teach them to read, you know. Uh, the slaves in America against the law to let them read. You know, I mean, right there is evidence of how they've always understood that with properly informed populace, you ain't got no chance of kicking them around. You know, they, they'll, they'll understand, the, you know, um, that's why social engineering is such an important thing for people to understand and to, you know, I mean, again, going right back to where I started at the beginning of this conversation, you know, Julian's work is trying to raise humanity to a level where they understand that to deal in the truth is the only way forward for us and for our chance to not only survive, but to flourish and blossom as you know, you know, I could go into all the kind of metaphysical concepts that I, you know, that inspire me to do what I'm doing right now. And I think that we cannot depend on our school systems. We cannot depend on getting our information from any news media, because even The Guardian has kind of fallen down on its knees on reporting properly on certain things, even though they report the Edward Center, because, you know, it's like... Um, uh, a good example is that all actors in the film industry sign a contract which says that they must, they have no choice, they must go out and promote the film. Even if it's the most exhausting, horrific experience they've ever had, they're going to have to sit down every day with, you know, 20 different journalists. They're going to have to tour all over the world. They've got to do it. They're in breach of their contract if they don't do it. If they screw up, if they say something like, you know, the director was a pain in the ass and I hated the whole thing, you know, they're gonna never gonna work again and they'll be lucky if they don't get a bullet in the head. So it's like the same treachery exists in politics. I mean, for instance, uh, Ron Paul was not able to discuss anything that happened after he left office for another year. So again, you know, I go back to the secrecy thing. Secrecy is destroying the progress of mankind. And unless we, you know, do an all out, you know, whole of mankind um, effort to dismantle these um, areas in government where secret entities exist, so secret that no one even knows that they're there, even like, you know, the president doesn't know that. I mean, the president is obviously you know, the little puppet at the front, and he has a certain amount of power, but, you know, as we've seen with JFK, you try and step out of line with the main military and you're, you know, so, um, and, you know, I'll be very surprised if, if Trump doesn't get a bullet at some point. I mean, I going back to Julian, because this is 
important to me. I would love to say to Julian that I hope that you understand that from the human beings that have their consciousness raised enough that they know what you're doing, man, you have such love coming at you, so much good intention. And just hang in there, you know, <laughs> just hang in there because at some point you will be free and don't let them get to you. You know, it's, it is, um, I mean, I just, you know, going back to talk to you again, I, I feel very emotional about it because I understand what it feels like to be, um, to be vilified, to be lied about, because I've certainly been lied about. And I've also watched, as I said, as a fly on the wall, the things that happened to my father. And um, uh, for instance, uh, I, I watched just recently because it was the 50th anniversary of 2001. And um, uh, I, I, I was in the film. I don't know if you know that, uh, but I was in it as a little girl. And um, when we were at the premiere in New York City, um, it was a huge affair, you know, all dignitaries and famous people and everything were all there. And um, there's this heartbreaking thing where there's a, you can find it on YouTube, where my father is just so beautifully talking about the impossibility of there not being intelligent life out there in the universe. And, you know, his, his whole, you know, lofty, expansive mind, you know, out in the front of his premiere, which must have been so nerve wracking, only to maybe half an hour later be met with the most horrific experience that any artist can go through that within the first 15 minutes of the film, two thirds of the invited audience walked out saying things like, I've never seen anything so blasphemous in all my life. You know, actually that was Rock Hudson. He walked past us like saying, you know, I've never seen anything blasphemous. All and um, it was absolute agony uh, because I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I mean, a premiere is basically super networking you get to show yourself off on the red carpet it's all like you know uh, you know the it's just it's basically a big promotional affair it's very very light it's not heavy so for that to turn into a sort of a mass walkout was absolutely terrifying and afterwards uh in shock uh the mgm executives unhelpfully called my father you know, shouting down the phone saying what a disaster it was and what were they going to do? And, and um, it was just some lowly, not very important MGM executive that then called my father and said, listen, I really hope that you don't listen to all the things they're saying because this film is incredible and they're going to see how wrong they are. Just don't listen to them. And we stayed up all night. And on the first showing, which I think must have been about 10 o'clock in the morning, we walked to the cinema and, you know, there was people standing in line. And then every subsequent show, my father went back around the corner to see, you know, where there were more people. And by the night, there was like lines around the building. And, and of course, you know, 2001 was hated and loved by the critics. But, you know, again, that's another aspect of human consciousness that I will never understand, which is you have these beings that are bringing inspiration and fascination and, and intelligent, you know, soul searching stories to the world or art or whatever it is. And then you've got some twat sitting there going, no, oh, I didn't like it. It's bloody rubbish. He should go and hang himself. It was so bad. And it's just like, can you imagine the world without art, you know, without paintings, without stories, without fabric, without furniture and, you know, it's like what artists and creative people bring. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm the worst chatterbox. But no, that, that is that is such a parallel to everything that WikiLeaks has done. I mean, the criticism yeah. that they get on that low level that you're describing in the reaction to 2001. I see the the direct parallel between that and the way people respond to WikiLeaks. Well, actually, good point because what it speaks to is a lack of conscious awareness, a lack of autonomy in the population, which you know, if we want to get esoteric about this, you know, who are we? We are consciousnesses, you know, are we going to evolve? Are we going to progress? Do we live eternally and jump in and out of bodies? You know, what is it? But 
certainly, even if we're just pieces of meat dragging our wounded selves around, um, there is an effort by many of us to, to reach up, you know, to not um, just dig down into the drudgery of life, but to, I mean, what is it? Was it Oscar Wilde that said, you know, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. You know, it's like, um, it's for those of us that have managed to shake ourselves out of a stupor, which is no, without question, we all suffer from that stupor now and again. I mean, I'm just as capable as the next person of going, you know, getting angry with somebody on the road or beeping my horn or whatever. But I'm aiming and I'm struggling to be the best human being that I can be. And Julian, is trying to be the best for mankind that he can be. And he's trying to alert people to the, I would say, not to be too depressing about this, but possible annihilation of us as a group of sentient beings. If we continue on this path of and, you know, I really do think you can put it down to this simplicity of secrecy within government and the destruction of proper education so that, you know, this all this horrific madness of the eugenics program and the way in which there's this almost perverse obsession with sort of genetic perfection, you know, I would say that in a way, the fact that that's such a focus for many of the elite, even to the point where they're, um, well, I, I, as I say, I got too many things in my mind. I, I, I want to go back to just the thing that really is important about Julian and why we should all be fighting for him is that not only does he deserve our support and our love and our actual extra effort in life. Yes, we've all got lots of things to do, but our extra effort to fight for him because he must win his freedom. Because in winning his freedom, he wins freedom for us. Because the more we push back, the more that we intimidate what really I am sure are truly cowardly people. Because I think that only cowards are attracted to reaching a level of power where they can just crush everyone. Because who would, who would want to crush everyone? Wouldn't you want to love everyone and, 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 and flourish together and inspire each other? People who have a strong um, instinct uh, to, um, not instinct, a, a strong sense of, I, I don't know what the right word is, but I just know that these people who, are crushing the world, are cowards, and they're terrified or they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. The fact that they've managed to accumulate power and wealth will never, ever protect them, never. When the cat is out the bag, which is what Julian is doing, what Edward Snowden is doing. I mean, imagine if Edward Snowden had never come out with all this information. I mean, when I think of James Clapper just going, nope, nope, we don't, uh, we don't uh, keep anyone's emails or surveil them. You know, it's such a, I, it, you know, what a perfect example of what bloody liars they are. But again, drawing a comparison to the film industry, trust me, I have watched great people tell big, fat, huge lies for whatever reason. So the, again, the raising of consciousness, the realizing that you cannot afford to lie we have to move beyond this in the way that we have to move beyond war as a form of communication, which it is. You know, you get to the point, I mean, you watch human beings individually fight with each other. First they're talking, then they're getting more angry, then they start shouting, and then finally they punch each other. And that's what war is. And it's just unacceptable. We cannot continue in this way. And if the powers that be don't understand that and they're locked in some horrible spiritual you know, degradation of their souls that they cannot see this themselves. We at least have to start putting our foot down. And frankly, 
you know, I think that's why they're so into these new robots and why they're into these, you know, killer bots is because they probably figure that after a while people go, you know what? If we don't pick up guns and start, you know, training to be soldiers, they can't, you know, do anything. And that's another reason why I think that, you know, the artificial intelligence and these, you know, robo killing, you know, devices, I think the people that are designing that are no better than, forgive me, because I know there was a big issue at the Second World War, but are no better than the Manhattan Project, where these scientists should have said, do you know what? As scientists, and of course, the German scientists should have said it as well. Again, levels of consciousness that these scientists don't have a level of consciousness where they go, you know what? I cannot afford to give this information out because the people that are going to use it have not got um, the. Uh, uh, well, you see, here's, uh, here's the confusing thing when you've got the level of consciousness to know not to use it, well, then. You, you know, all, all of it just evaporates. And as long as we have people whose consciousness is so low, whose vibration is just so low that, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, it's totally fine. I have a, I have a question for you. Um, I, I, I was wondering um, earlier in the vigil, Susie Dawson, and a number of us have made comparisons uh, between what Julian is experiencing and Nelson Mandela's experience of solitary oh. confinement as well, because uh, not only because of the issue of solitary confinement, but the need for public outcry on their behalf to see them be freed. And so mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, in the case of Nelson Mandela, there was a huge effort by Hollywood and uh, a number of, of just mega stars musically to come together to support Nelson Mandela. Do you, th why are uh, so few like, uh, uh, representatives from uh, uh, Hollywood and, and related industries, why are so few coming out in support of Julian Assange? I think that you make the assumption that these actors and actresses and filmmakers are any less socially engineered than the rest of everyone else who's socially engineered. And plus, there is a degree of courage involved and a willingness to sacrifice your career. And, you know, again, these, if they would all do it, they would lose nothing, you know, but when, you know, I've watched it, actually. Um, when you're with somebody that's extremely famous and there are people around, a lot of times those extremely famous people are out of control. They're rude. They're on drugs. They do the most like things that make you your eyes water. It's so outrageous. But everyone is so intimidated that they don't say anything. They don't say, bloody hell, that was a bit rude. What, you know, what are you doing? They just sort of go, <laughs> you know, and they kind of laugh and they, 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 they just. So what I'm really saying is that you're depending on these people who, by the nature of the business, are very, very used to um, suppressing what they feel for fear of losing. You know, it's a very small bottleneck. You know, I don't know how many films that are made, but believe me, there are, you know, gazillion actors and actresses, a gazillion directors and producers, and almost none of them get a chance to do anything. And, Huge um, point. Yeah, and so very much like in politics, you know, if you're very ambitious and you want to lead the world, you know, you're going to probably, by the time you get to the top, you're going to be exactly the person they want you'll do anything in order to stay where you are, which is why I'm saying that these positions of power attract the worst individuals, I think, you know, and I think that there's, you know, the, sorry, I, I have so many things to say on these things that I could probably go off on tangents all over the place, but to go back to Julian, his suffering and his um, plight particularly now with social media, where in a second, you, I mean, look what happened to Roseanne, you know, in a second, ABC shut down her show. I mean, I don't, I don't even care what she said. I'm just trying to say, look what happens. Um, that people, you know, look, we're talking about tyranny. Julian is fighting tyranny. 
We are fighting tyranny. Tyranny is not kind, is not patient, is not willing to give you an inch. And as long as people um, stay, in the, stay in communication with each other, to give each other the courage. I mean, for instance, I think if, if more people in Hollywood actually came forward, I mean, look, actually, look what happened with Harvey Weinstein. There was a few women that kind of went, oh, bloody hell, I'm just going to go for it. And then once they did, others came forward. Now, call it human nature or call it levels of consciousness or call it enfeebled people or whatever you want to say. The fact is it makes a difference when people come forward. I mean, when I did the interview, uh, the only other interview, this is my second interview in the history of my life, um, which I did with Alex Jones. Um, sorry, what? No, no, I was just going to say I, I, it's even more of a pr privilege then that this is, <laughs> this is uh, such a rare experience for us to be able to, uh, to hear from you about this. So, Well, and, and for me, you know, it's, for me it's also uh, a, a point of my own integrity. When I got a message from Susie earlier on, I thought it was just yesterday and I thought it was done. And she said, no, no, it's carrying on. So I just thought, bloody hell, you know, I'm just going to do it. Um, Vivian. What? Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever sleep? I am so sorry. Well, <laughs> don't worry. Actually, don't worry. What? I, went to, I went to sleep with my what telephone. Poor Elizabeth. I was just saying something. Can you, can you guys hear me? Are you there? There you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can. Oh, I was, I was going to break an intro. You, it's not a problem at all. Yeah, so all glad right, to I'll have Susie back. Okay. Yeah, it's I'm fine. Sorry. I'll just, I'll just totally gate crash your guys. Okay, interview. okay. Um, yeah, yeah. We had very carefully scheduled it so that each of us could do a block of interviews, Elizabeth and I, and then we could sleep. Except yeah. instead of sleeping, I kept working for the last two oh. days oh. and trying to just survive on one hour naps, and then I oh went to. God. I went to sleep thinking that I had three separate alarms scheduled to wake me up. And I, I, I woke up to discover that I had left my headphones plugged into the device that had my oh, alarm, which, oh. which meant I didn't hear any of my alarms. So I am so, so, so sorry. Don't, don't worry at all, at all, please. I'm but glad I'm that you slept. so happy that you're here. I'm, yes, I'm me too. I'm so pleased that you're here. And yes. I am simultaneously excited and pleased for Elizabeth to have got to interview the people that she's got to interview in, in the last few hours particularly um, and simultaneously mortified that she's had to do such a long hosting stint <laughs> in order to pull it off. Well don't worry I didn't put it to much work because I haven't stopped talking I think since the moment I came on <laughs> so don't worry she probably could have had a good snooze while I was talking. No offense Elizabeth I'm kidding um, but uh Vivian, I, 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 if yeah. I could, sorry, if I could just ask you, because we were supposed to wrap in nine minutes, but okay. I'd just like to ask you just to recap for me your your thoughts on Julian's situation, on the urgency of, of his situation presently uh, at his location, um, and on, on why it is that you were prepared to, as you say, this is your, only your second interview ever, why it is that you were prepared to step forward and speak for Julian? Well, I was saying to Elizabeth in this interview that uh, Julian is placed himself in an almost Christ-like position in the world where he is taking the burden of the lack of, you know, the, the, the lowered level of consciousness prevalent on this planet right now, doubtless because, you know, social engineering, um, the absolute hopeless level of education so that people are you know generation after generation uh, brought up so ignorant of the actual business of running this planet that they are unaware how they are manipulated and are and uh, you know are i don't know what the phrase is i i know there is one where they're sort of um enfeebled um, to the extent that is satisfying to the elite and always has been. I was saying about, you know, pre-revolutionary France where the peasants, it was against the law to teach them to read as it was black slaves, you know, in, in, in America. Um, because education is what allows people to engage in a meaningful way 
with those in power. And if we, you know, Julian is, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to address something that I addressed before, so I'm kind of repeating myself. But the thing that, the reason why I came on is because Julian's efforts to bring truth to the world is not in order to be sensational, not in order to, you know, um, uh, spitefully ruin the career of Hillary psychopath Clinton, but, uh, excuse me, I just really think that woman is frightening, um, but is in fact, he is trying to forward a new evolution for mankind, which consists of raising our consciousness to the point where we understand that truth, transparency, and the ability to, uh, I, I was, I wrote that to you today earlier in, in my um, uh, messaging with you, that in order for us to correct uh, what's going on on this planet, in order to weed out the psychopaths, the criminals, in order to dismantle those things in government that operate completely in secret, in order to dismantle those things, we have to start with people understanding what's really happening. And they're never going to find that out from the news media because the news media, particularly in America, is controlled by six corporations. And as we know, corporations are not known for their altruistic, um, uh, uh, freedom-loving uh, ways. They're quite the opposite. And they're motivated by things that I believe man needs to evolve out of. You know, we need to evolve beyond the love of power and money. And I think that Julian is, unfortunately for him, um, absolutely spearheading in the Western world I mean, perhaps it could happen in the rest of the world, but there simply isn't the technology. So in the Western world, he is spearheading the, 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 the essential evolutionary progress that will come from truth. You know, it doesn't matter. It's not about using accountability to punish people. He, I don't think he's interested in punishing people. I think he's interested in releasing mankind from those factions that that are threatening the survival of us as beings you know we cannot progress as the human race when we are socially engineered and you know don't get me started on eugenics um when our uh, you know I, I think as i was saying um earlier you know those that are that reach levels of power that, you know, the elite or people like Jeff Bezos or, you know, Zuckerberg or whatever, these are men who are so unfit for that position of power, precisely because I don't think they are the power source. I think it's probably more, you know, the dark shadow government entities, the CIA. I mean, I was listening to Ray McGovern. Sorry, I am just all over the place. You'll forgive me. Um, I was listening to Ray McGovern, who is like a 27-year veteran of the CIA, and he put it really well that he said that, you know, the CIA was born with a birth defect. Essentially, it was important that the president would have analysts looking at all the things going on in the big geopolitical chessboard. But unfortunately, the whole um, secret service that operated in the Second World War was sort of you know, kind of glommed on to the CIA so that probably it would have happened anyway, but that it, this idea of secrecy and that, you know, for, this, for national security purposes, this can't be revealed. I would say that this is the thing that Julian is attacking and that is why he is being 21st century tortured. You know, <laughs> you know they Very have... Well put. Yeah, he, they haven't got him in irons, you know, starving away in the bottom of a dungeon. But for 21st century beings, he's in the equivalent. He is suffering in his soul. He is isolated. And I would think also at this point, the sheer enormity, the, 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 the enormity of that man's soul cramped up in that 
really um, uh, constant, chronic, depressing imprisonment is exactly what they want. They want him to break. And I've no doubt, you know, when you look at something like uh, I was reading the uh, years ago now, I can't remember exactly, but when they um, released the um, torture manual that was used in, in uh, South America. And I don't know if you've read it. Have you read the CIA torture manual? No, I've read part of the, um, or what's been publicly released of the Senate torture report, but not of the... Uh, well, I'll, I'll send you a link to it. I'll, I'll find it again. I mean, lots of it's been redacted. There's lots of bits mm -hmm. missing. But the primary thing is... It's really interesting because the shock and awe thing, it's there in the torture manual. And it, it, it suddenly occurred to me that the, the, this shock and awe thing, this like, you know, we're in, what, what's that thing with, you know, we're in uh, orange alert or whatever, or red alert, you know, what's yeah, that thing? The in America? The, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that in the uh, torture manual, it actually says that the threat of being tortured is far more effective than actually torturing somebody, than actually giving them physical pain, because many of them discover that they can actually stand it or they die. But the threat of it happening. So, you know, the methodology, I mean, I really think there should, you know, we should all start to try and put together the playbook of the elite because it's now becoming so obvious, you know, the manipulation and the social engineering and the methods that they've used um, are such that, you know, Again, sorry, I'm trying to stay on point. I'm terrible. Um, we can recap if you like, because what I hear you saying, I hear you saying a couple of things. I hear you saying information is power. Yes. Truth is the pathway to the emancipation of humanity. Yes. Yes. Well from, said. From the I chains do that bind us. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, the chain, from the chains that bind us. And yes. what you're saying is that th those chains are the result of a well-honed methodology honed yes. across generations, if not centuries. Uh, I mean, without question, yes. And in fact, you look at the Pharisees of, you know, when Christ was trying to, you know, give people his, his Christ consciousness, um, you know, all they felt was threatened. You know, I mean, you'd think they'd be out there maybe listening to him going, bloody hell, that's beautiful. I love that, what he just said, you know. But no, and very much like, you know, when, when the priests of Christianity would read the Bible to the, you know, the, the, the poor peasants in Latin so that they couldn't even understand what was being said, you know, preciously guarding their power. This is a trait. This is a spiritual state that, that people who are attracted to positions of power seem to be honestly spiritually diseased in their struggle to have power over others. Now, if we want to deal with that as humanity, we certainly have to start by breaking up the, uh, the mechanisms, uh, break up the organizations, break up the lies. And I think Julian is doing that. And that's why he's paying such a terrible price. And I was actually saying to Elizabeth before, somebody on Twitter, because I, I tweeted something out about Julian's situation and uh, they said to me you know he can leave anytime he likes sorry i'm repeating mm -hmm. this everyone who is listening um but he can leave anytime he likes you know he's perfectly safe and i said you're you're putting the yourself in the position of knowing more than julian and his own legal team don't you think that there is a reason why he's not walking out that door you know, it's not like anyone could claim for one second that Julian lacks courage. You know, he knows what will happen. All of us know what will happen. Can you imagine the people in power who are so incredibly, um, I mean, it's wrong of them to be angry. But of course, at that level of consciousness, they're not going to be aware that they've done anything wrong. So they're going to feel free to be angry at someone who's exposing them. But the more that each one of us pours light on this situation, talks about it, comes to dinner parties and, you know, makes oneself perhaps a little unpopular by talking about these things. 
But really, it's our duty to the best of our ability to um, assist others. And I don't mean to be patronizing because it's just the truth. You have to assist people to, to get to the truth. And it's very, very hard. It's a terribly severe reality adjustment to suddenly realize that you've been so lied to. But, you know, again, I said this to Elizabeth, but, you know, I have it, a, a somewhat unique vantage point in that I've watched like a fly on the wall, a very famous man's life, you know, and all the things that he went through and all the incredible intrigues and bizarre things that he had to go through and the real death threats that my father faced for being an artist, for God's sake, speaking truth that wasn't even nailing anyone specific. And yet he was, you know, a target. And uh, Speaking societal truths because he's deconstructing... Yes. He's deconstructing their mosaic that they blind us with. Well, and he's also, I think, you know, my, my perfect example is Dr. Strangelove, because actually that was what I was going to tell you when we were talking earlier, um, is that uh, when he did Dr. Strangelove, this extremely bizarre coincidence, oh, sorry, if we were like Zoom past nine minutes, I can see you want to yawn. It's you're fine, fine, you're fine, you're <laughs> fine, you're fine, you're fine, keep going. Uh, okay, um, is that uh, on the day that of the premiere of Dr. Strangelove was the day JFK was assassinated. And I thought that that was such a particularly spooky coincidence, given the fact that in 1984, Noam Chomsky had it in his book, that that scenario that was depicted in Dr. Strangelove is actually what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I'll have to send you the, I've got it in my iPad, which I'm using right now, so I can't show it to you. But um, where it was an actual general that upped the, um, uh, uh, I shouldn't try and quote it because I can't remember it properly. But anyway, in effect, the actual scenario that occurred actually was depicted in the film, which, you know, you can say whatever you like about it, but that is pretty bloody amazingly weird. And... I, I also was telling you that um, uh, he was contacted by the CIA once Dr. Strangelove had been released. And he was, they, 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 in a rather suave way, invited him to be interviewed. And he, in a very suave response, said, I decline to be interviewed. <laughs> but they were obviously perturbed by. I assume now thinking about it, that it must have been the fact that it's it, it so closely depicted what actually happened. And um, so I must, I must send you this thing. Sorry, I'm squawking, forgive me. Um, uh, what you're saying I, though about, about the revelation of truth and whether it's Julian Assange or whether it's your father's films that, that reveal these core truths, I think people do sometimes misperceive uh, the revelation of truth as, as just automatically uh, leading to a happy ending, you know, rainbows and butterflies and it's all good, like the truth will set you free. But from what you're saying and from what we've seen with Julian Assange and what we've seen from our guests and panellists throughout this whole vigil is that truth tellers get punished so harshly and that it is a painful as you as you said it's a painful process to be a truth teller it's not easy and that's that's what i'm hearing from you uh about in, in the recollection of, of your father's experience in that yeah i mean obviously he he said to me uh that he only made his films about things that he was profoundly interested in if for no other than the practical reason of um, you know, he needs to maintain his interest over several years while he was making it. But he said, which I think is very significant, is that if you try to change people's minds or try to kind of force things down people's throats, you're making propaganda. You're not making art. And um, maybe Lenny Riefenstahl managed to sort of like cross art with propaganda. But, you know, Anyway, it's just because she was a rather wonderful photographer, but, you know, everything else about it was vile. Um, but I think as far as Julian is, is, as far as his future is concerned, 
he depends on us. He depends on every person, whether you're the most um, uninformed or insignificant person in the world. Uh, if you have a sense that an injustice is occurring here, you have a duty to contact whoever is your local representative, contact you know your local newspaper, however grassroots you want to do it, and to raise the issue as to what crime has this man committed? Because the only thing he's committed is the truth for people to look at. And the fact that the powers that be can um, justify their attempts to shut him up by saying this is a national security issue is the core of the lie. Because the lie is that there must be secrecy about such things. Now, I believe that transparency and the analysis of crimes all the way through to tragic mistakes is the only way that we as mankind are going to be able to correct our society. And as long as the judicial system is corrupt, as long as we have media that is strangled by those in power, which is why the internet and YouTube should have been and stayed a platform for what obviously became uncontrollable, which is now why they've got all these Google algorithms and why YouTube is like censoring people. And, you know, I can only say that all the people who are running their technology, I am praying that these people are not victims of social engineering that their education and their knowledge and their observation of what's going on gives them enough information to realize that they have to help in this effort to free mankind from this tyranny of technology. It's both the way in which we'll be free, and if we're not careful, it's the way in which we will be crushed forever. So what Julian is doing, and I was saying before to you, the fact that he said everyone should download documents and things like that, that's beautiful. I love that. I'm all for that. You know, that's, that means we're all in this together. And in that respect, we must be in it together with him now. And these vigils and, the, and you know, the fact that I've come on here and to some extent committed verbal diarrhea, forgive me, um, I, uh, I just want people to, to not have courage, but just simply to realize that, this is our only path forward. You know, our path forward is um, a loving camaraderie for those who have been brave and to support each other in this effort, to help educate each other gently and not in an insulting or abusive way, and to understand that we must create education for our children. We must create education for adults to let them understand the way in which they're being manipulated. And once that's done, it's over. They, they really don't have that much power. They really don't. It's all smokes and mirrors. And without all that smokes and mirrors, sorry, one last thing, Charlotte Isabel. I really encourage people to look at the deliberate dumbing down of America. She identified in the early 80s the systematic destruction of, of the education system in America. And she has like a gazillion, you know, documentation. I mean, she's actually a kind of an early WikiLeaks, really. She had, you know, she bought documentation. I'm gabbling on and on, forgive me. No, I know. You're it's right, you're ended, educate, like you are educating us, which is <laughs> what this is all about. I cannot tell you how much I have learned in the last three days from every single person I have spoken to. I have taken away knowledge that I did not have before and shared in their, uh, their experience and their vantage point in a way that I hadn't been able to. And I've been, I can see Elizabeth nodding, so I think she's had the same experience um, in the, the interviews that she's performed. It's really been a remarkable experience to bring together people from so many different backgrounds and so many different specialities and to have them share from the heart you know from all of these different ideological positions these different geographical locations um different career paths fundamentally saying the same thing but 
just it's like they're all piling sticks on the donkey's back you know and we're we're just nearly at that point where it's going to break so i i deeply appreciate the information that you're sharing with us because you are yet another unique advantage a uh, unique vantage point well i i think the crucial thing is that people must really really stop reading the newspapers i just don't know how else to put it the newspapers are a, a form of disinformation that is so insidious because ultimately what their real what their main technique is is they make people get to a point where they don't know what to think and then they go oh screw it i just i don't know what the truth is and that's what they want they just want people to give up the ghost and not bother to try and sort out for themselves what the truth is so i would just suggest that people pull out their fingers understand that in order for mankind to go forward for us to raise ourselves up into higher beings in order to explore this extraordinary universe and who knows what else other dimensions other possibilities that we have yet to experience and make real for ourselves we can only do that if we free ourselves and that can only happen if we join which is one of the principal things they try to do is divide us we must join in a concerted effort to educate ourselves and treat it as a job it is not enough to be a citizen because there's so much organization that has dismantled our actual cit citizenry and that if you don't want to just go and live in a cave somewhere on your own we're going to have to get this right and clean up the mess and julian is absolutely one of the foremost freedom fighters on this in this modern age and he deserves so much love he deserves so much encouragement and support but he really deserves our active help in freeing him and not freeing him to the vagaries of the dangers of the outside world we must liberate him legally and to whatever extent we can help in that even if it's just to encourage each other to be brave and come forward and speak you know so i thank you seriously i thank you for giving me this 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 outlet for my true heartfelt sorrows on his behalf but also my real thrill at the prospect of him being released and him continuing his work because it would be such a feather in the cap of humanity for him to be freed because that's just a that's you know that's like when um i know people don't like tommy robertson whatever but they you know are, are, they arrested him and they gave him a 13 month sentence and they they made it the, the 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 um the judge made it illegal for anyone to report on his arrest and and imprisonment and even the guardian right went oh, hang on a second and the independent they went no i'm sorry whatever tommy robinson is you can't just put a gag order on us reporting on what happened at his trial and why why he was in prison and i went all bananas about it and people were saying tommy robinson's a bloody racist and he should you know who gives a shit and it was like people don't you get you have to protect everyone's rights even if you absolutely bloody detest them because that is the that is the underpinning of a civilized society and anyway i could go on all sadly night, sadly me. that's a <laughs> sadly that is a global trend we have yeah. had a situation recently in new zealand where the new zealand government has been attempting to revoke the passports and or citizenship of new zealand citizens in secret courts where the per, the citizen that they're targeting is not invited to appear in the court or notified that there is a trial and their um lawyers are not notified and they're not allowed to have any legal representation and the press are barred from entry in the courtroom and are barred from reporting on it so this unfortunately this the secret war secret proceedings uh, we see it in america as well they use um you know national security or whatever other pretext to do it but moving back to julian i just mm. wanted to touch on a point that you just made which is a very something that we commonly hear which is he can just leave the embassy at any time you know julian can just and if you search on those words on twitter and i've done it before mm -hmm. and screenshotted mm. the results 
the precise wording, word for word, there's pages of it going back years of this. So this is like a seeded narrative um, of his persecutors that they want people to parrot and, and to repeat. And that mm-hmm. is he can leave it any time, he can leave it any time, he can leave it. It's like this mantra, right, that was supposed to convince mm-hmm. us that the onus is on the persecuted, the onus is not on the persecutors. Um, but somebody made a brilliant comparison a couple of weeks ago. They said, well, you know what? For all the complaining that Anne Frank did in her diary, Anne Frank could have left at any time. <laughs> and, and oh, Frank, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Exactly. No, analogy. you're correct to laugh because it's, it's, the perfect, <laughs> it's the perfect depiction of the situation. You know, and, and mm. Frank trapped in her little room Mm. She could in her little cupboard. She could have left at any time. She could have just walked out the door into the arms of the Nazis. Why didn't she walk out the door into the arms of the Nazis if she didn't want to live in this little confined space as a you know a persecuted figure? Right. Um, and that is exactly the situation with Julian. Yes, Julian can walk into the arms of the Nazis at any time, but I, yeah. that would ni- that would neither be sane nor just for him to do so. Look, Edward Snowden, he, he's a perfect real-world example of someone that went, hmm, I don't think this is going to pan out if I go through the normal channels. Uh, this is probably going to, I'll be lucky if I don't get killed. You know, I mean, look, in the end, this comes down to people raising their consciousness, people taking responsibility, which can only really happen if they are helped through education through truth, through people talking to one another, because it, it, it doesn't automatically occur to you. I mean, you know, when I was in my 30s, I wouldn't, I, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't have even been thinking about anything like this. You know, the level of ignorance is precise and intended. You know, when we're at school, we should be educated to learn statecraft, to understand politics so that we can really take part. But of course, they don't want that. They don't want any interference. They don't, you know, and I was saying to Elizabeth, those least qualified to take point, you know, leadership roles are those most likely to get them because they're the most brutal, most unprincipled, most unethical and willing to just stomp on people to get where they want to go. And as I said, I feel like I have a, a vantage point that is totally parallel from having grown up in the film industry and the show business, which believe me is blood curdlingly uh, as, you know, treacherous and dangerous as politics. And in many ways it's sort of married to the whole system of social engineering Mm. and everything else, especially now. But look, I love what you have done. I love Julian. I pray for him. And I hope that everyone that's watching this, becomes expansive in their uh, in their efforts to help him i mean to whatever degree that people want to be creative about it the more that people talk about this the more just like tommy robinson the more that people came out and went wait this is unacceptable they backed down and they went oh okay you know you can talk about it and write about it now you know because they know that they don't actually have the power once people really know the information once they can think for themselves, which of course they are mostly programmed to disable their abilities to think and fantastically distracted and taught, like I was saying to Elizabeth earlier, to not actually communicate, but to just bam, bam, what's the word? Bash each bam. other with yeah. insults and, 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 you know, not at real exchange of ideas, but just a sort of a, a verbal violence. You know, and people have learned this from all these horrible reality programs and it's intended. I just, you know, at a certain point, I kind of don't understand why people don't see it. But anyway. Well, I think this is what people call waking up, right, is that all of a sudden you do see it. There's some catalyzing event in your life where you realize, oh, my God, everything was a lie. Everything I was taught was a lie. And I think that compels people to seek the truth. And we see millions of people are having this experience of waking up, as they say, uh, to the reality. (laughs) And yeah, that moment comes where you can no longer ignore 
the uh, the severity to which you you have been manipulated, could we? Right. Both individually and as a society. Um, Look, and you're I, right. I, Julian Julian has pulled that curtain down. You know, from the Wizard of Oz, he has um, the as who was it? I think Mark Crispin Miller was saying earlier on tonight he's the media studies professor from new york university he was saying that the emperor is now naked and everybody knows it is naked it mm -hmm. is in the public square and it has no clothes on and everybody is staring at it and thinking the emperor is naked um that's, uh, actually, the, just, that's the moment we're at yeah i just want to add that once people see it the important part is is that they will try to strike back by terrifying everyone either with a you know, a world event that will be terrifying, but it will be orchestrated in many ways what I think 9-11 was or Pearl Harbor or any other thing that's orchestrated as a false flag or as a way to manipulate people. And I just, I just want people to be calm and to understand, and I hate to sound so trite, but I really do believe that, that goodness does win out in the end and we'll get there quicker if people just try really hard to involve themselves, even if it's just to educate themselves. But in Julian's case, I think it's in all of our interest. I mean, not only just compassion for him, but it's in all of our interest to not only defend him, but to actively work towards his release legally and to have him protected legally so that anyone that would take him out would, well, it would start a, an absolute avalanche of, uh, awareness that we're really up against the kinds of elites that we're up against you know I mean they don't want to expose themselves that much I imagine but look I know that we've gone way beyond the point of where mm. we should have finished so I just want to really thank you so much for doing this vigil for him and Julian I just want you to know that there's so many people out here rooting for you and be strong because you're a good and decent man and you will prevail. And we're all out here sending you love. And we're all going to try and help you. So please hang in there. That is gorgeous, Vivian. That is really, <laughs> truly gorgeous. The empathy um, is key. Yes. The, the, the empathy is, the, is what connects us. Um, and the empathy is what drives us to take risks. This, I believe, is true in Julian's case as well. Julian is a very empathic person. Um, this is why he he wanted to end wars. He he do, he wanted to prevent people dying, and he knew that the truth is a vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as we hold on to our empathy and we act for the betterment of other people, I think you are completely correct that that goodness will win out in the end. Yes, don't hang out, don't don't hang out on the perimeter, everyone. Just get in there, muck in. And um, <laughs> and understand well, that any we... contribution that sorry, oh go ahead please yeah just understand that any contribution that you make you're contributing to a, a, a an avalanche of energy that I really do think will shift the consciousness of mankind and I think that's what's happening you know so uh, you know everyone should take heart don't let the media don't let the powers that be make you feel that there's no hope or that you haven't got a chance because that's really their only card they're playing because they know perfectly well that when enough people get together and organize and see the truth, <laughs> their game is over. That is Thank an amazing you. sentiment to end, end this vigil with and end uh, this segment with, I think. That's just a beautiful, beautiful sentiment thank you so much for sharing your time with us it's been an okay. honor to speak with you <laughs> thank you thank Elizabeth. you vivian uh, thank i'm you hoping so much susie oh you're so. so you're so welcome thank you so much for being here um and we will certainly be inviting you back because we would like to grow the circle of conscious people that we've brought together this weekend and mm -hmm. to constantly expand this and, and to make it as accessible to as many different types of people as we can going forward and to build this to strengthen Julian's position. So thank you so, so, so much. I would love that. And thank you. And I hope you have a beautiful, lovely sleep and rest, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Vivian. And bye-bye, everyone who's watching.